I want to start with a topic that's of major importance for the global economy, and that's China. Let's begin with a question for the audience. How many of you are optimistic about China's economy? Can we see a show of hands? Interesting. So surprise, our two guests are not optimistic about China and haven't been for quite some time. Jim, you've got a great story about what piqued your interest in China. Will you share it? Well, I mean, we got interested in China. We're, we're stock pickers, and we're not so-called macro investors. Um, and uh, our interest in China uh, came about in the fall of '09 when we were trying to figure out why it was that some of the commodity producers were reporting record profits into the teeth of the global financial crisis. And we knew it inherently it was due to China. And we're talking about iron ore companies, steel companies, uh, aluminum, cement, uh, copper. And... Uh, my real estate analyst was putting some figures on the board and said, currently China has uh, under development 5.6 billion square meters of high-rises, roughly half residential and half office and mixed use. And I said, he was a young man, I said, well, Alex, you're getting your nomenclature wrong because we think in square feet and they're square meters. It can't be 5.6 billion square feet, uh, meters, that's 60 billion square feet. And he looked at me as only sort of a terrified young analyst could. He said, I triple-checked it. It's 5.6 billion square meters. And it sort of hit me that if half of that was office space, roughly 30 billion square feet, that was a five-foot-by-five-foot office cubicle for every man, woman, and child in China. And that's been built over twice now since 2010. And it really rammed home to me the scope of the urban build-out that was occurring in a very short period of time in China and just how much debt was being taken on to do it and, and what a basically one-off for the world economy this is turning out to be. And we still believe that. So back in 2011, another prominent Wall Streeter dismissed you by saying shorting China is basically shorting the march of history. And even today, people say that you're wrong because China's official growth figures have been strong and, and are projected to continue to be strong. What do you make of those arguments? Well, I always point out, first, it's a communist totalitarian state, so the figures are going to be what they want you to believe. More importantly, though, even with that, when we started looking at China, China's nominal um, GDP rate was about 16, 17 percent. And that's the important one for, for paying off their internal debt. And uh, it's now about 8%. It's actually ticked up from 6 because they've gone back to slightly inflation versus deflation. So their, their nominal growth rate has been cut in half in the last five years. Their markets have gone nowhere, um, albeit with a lot of volatility. Um, but more interestingly, we've been involved in sort of the first derivatives of China, Macau, iron ore companies, cement companies, shipping companies. Um, and they've been just absolutely terrific on the short side. So in a general global bull market, one of the few places you've been able to hide has been in the China play. <laughs> Kyle, you went public with your views on China a year ago. And for you, it's all about the banking system. You have a great chart. Can we show it? And can you help explain it? Sure. Uh, th this chart is a, is a subset of what's most relevant in the banking system. To, to the crowd, what's important to understand what, what Jim just said uh, uh, is is absolutely um, it's earth shattering, right? Given given the build out of both commercial and, and resi space in China, but what f what fuels that's a banking system. So we studied the banking system in the U.S., in Europe, Japan, and China, and uh, that's where I think our expertise is. But when you look at their banking system, um, they have an economy today of about twelve trillion dollars uh, in GDP. They have thirty seven trillion dollars worth of banking assets. So they have 330% of their GDP in their banks. To put it into context, the U.S. going into the financial crisis was about 170% of GDP, including the non-banks, the Fedies, the Freddies, the Fannies, and all the non-bank depository, non-depository institutions. This chart here is a subset of that banking system. And what's, what's relevant here, if you remember uh, the asset liability mismatches, those vehicles that called structured investment vehicles or ABCP conduits or those kinds of things, where the liability side uh, rolls very quickly, but the assets inside are like seven, 10, 30 year assets. So these are asset liability mismatched products in the banking system. At our worst, we were two and a half percent of our system in asset liability mismatches and things that really brought the acuity of the crisis to the banks right away. In China, there's four and a half trillion dollars worth of asset liability mismatches today 
as per Chinese bank annual reports. And that is almost four times as bad as the U.S. was. Uh, and so the point I'm trying to make is with this slide is in, in kind of the worst possible kind of assets, it's four times worse than we were at our peak in 2006. So for those that believe somehow China with a declining working age population in a banking system that's been recklessly built, if we think China is going to grow 6.5% from now on, or 8% nominally, um, I just think that, that they're wrong. And I think that um, if you follow what's happening right now, sometime in the next 18 months, you're going to see a real banking crisis in China, even, even though they are a communist totalitarian <laughs> government. Economic gravity um, takes over. Well, to, to amplify on Kyle's point, it, what you have now is you still have a banking system that is growing assets at two to three times, depending on the, uh, how big the shadow bank it, system is, of nominal GDP. So we think banking and shadow banking assets will grow somewhere around 20% this year. Put that in perspective. That, as he points out, that will be new debt to the tune of six, seven trillion U.S. dollars in a 10, 11 trillion dollar, 12 trillion dollar economy. And I would dare say that if the U.S. did a similar type stimulus, say 10 trillion in new debt on a 17 trillion dollar economy, we'd be growing at 6% too. There's no magic to this. I mean, they're, they're literally almost half of the economy is construction still. After all these years, it's still investment. And so, um, of course, the problem becomes every time you finish a building, you reset to zero. You've got to start to build a new building. And this is the inherent problem. And it's, by the way, very similar to something Kyle knows better than I do. It's very similar to the Japanese model in the late 80s, except this one's on steroids. There's a big difference, I'll, and we'll let, you, we'll let you start. The big difference between China and Japan is China doesn't have any international assets, right? The Chinese people, in general, only have about 20% of their GDP invested externally. So China has this impossible trilemma. They want to try to hold their exchange rate um, constant. They want to liberalize their capital counter, open their economy, and yet they can't do those things all at the same time because it'll, it will decimate their currency. So they made a lot of money by basically exporting cheap labor uh, or cheap labor's uh, benefits to the rest of the world. But if the Chinese are allowed to travel some more and buy some foreign assets, um, it's, it basically means it's just China's going to need to readjust. It's not the end of the world. This isn't a Lehman moment. It's a moment that uh, those that are allocating money to Southeast Asia need to be really wary of in the next two years. So just as with Jim, a lot of people think that you are dead wrong. You noted earlier this year that you've had numerous discussions with various Wall Street firms, consultants, other respected China experts, and they almost all think you're wrong. Does this bother you when most people think that you're wrong? Well, I know, Jim, <laughs> yes, it bothers me. But, uh, it does? <laughs> um, um, I, I, I'd, like to, I'd love to tell an anecdote, um, so I'll leave the person's name um, out, of, out, of the, out of the conversation. But last week, the chief economist of one of the biggest investment banks in China came to see me. And um, she had written a uh, rebuttal to something that I wrote in February, basically saying that the Chinese foreign exchange reserves aren't exactly what they're reporting. Um, and I went through a very detailed analysis using f all the facts provided by China's t statistical services showing how the number didn't reconcile. And um, she said, well, uh, it, it, Heyman doesn't know what they're talking about. Kyle doesn't know what he's talking about. That, the, the sovereign wealth assets for the sovereign wealth fund are not included in the FX reserves. And so I put, a, I put the sheet of paper in front of her that showed 10 years, um, actually 20 years, of this data series. And I said, well, if it, w if it had been subtracted, you'd see a step function change in the PBOC's data series. And she said, well, reporting got better in 2010. You just have to believe me. Um, you know, and that's, I think this, this belief, and I call it the, this apostolic belief in China's, Chinese government's omnipotence, is what everybody tends to believe in. Yep. Right? And if you just look at the facts, right, you wouldn't invest in China today. Um, and that, that's the point that, that I make. So all the arguments that I try to make are fact-based and not um, yeah, just believe in the, in the, in the, um, in the government. Uh, and I think that's uh, a lot of, of what Jim does and what I do. And unfortunately, it's a lonely place. Right? Um, yeah. Although, Jim, Jim I, what's, what's, I, what's wrong with trust me? What's wrong with apostolic belief in omnipotence? It sounds very reassuring to me. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It, 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 it can be more profitable for a while, but ultimately reality does tend to hold. And, um, you know, look, I'm being used to, to be called wrong. I was married for 20 years. So, you know, that's something, that's something that, you know, you get used to 
pretty pretty easily. But um, but again, the data the data is is telling us that something is, is unprecedented is happening in this country, and I think that that for those that believe in in the omnipotence of the Chinese Communist Party, um, I would just simply point to 2015. As, as the summer of 2015, when the government, which had promoted the stock market um, and told people to go buy stocks on leverage uh, in late 14, early 15, suddenly realized they had a problem on their hands and, and tried to put it in reverse and caused a crash. Um, and then just put out a series of just mind-numbing, conflicting directives and, and orders to the financial markets um, and if anyone really thinks that this group of seven guys in a room has the markets figured out and has, has financial um, plumbing figured out, they didn't. It was very clear. And so I think that uh, you, you only need point to a little over a year ago to see their response in, in what was basically a stock market crisis.